Welcome to OTC Markets ed Educational Webinar, Putting the Power of PR Behind Your IR Message, featuring Seth Linden and Ed Neb of Dukas Linden Public Relations Firm. My name is Bob Power, Vice President of OTC Markets Corporate Services Group. Thanks for taking the time for this informative session. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest speakers from Dukas Linden PR Firm. Seth Linden, President, and Ed Meb, Senior Managing Director at Dukas Linden Public Relations. Seth and Ed, thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bob, and thanks to uh, OTC Markets for giving us the opportunity to speak with all of you this morning. Uh, we'll chat for a few minutes, 20 or 25, and then we'll take Q&A, and, and uh, I'm sure that'll be the most interesting part of the presentation. Uh, I'm Ed Neb, as Bob mentioned. I'm Senior Managing Director at Dukas Linden PR. Most of my career has been spent in investor relations, working with uh, small and mid-cap public companies, uh, but uh, I've also had a significant track record in strategic financial communications, uh, content creation, and so on. And uh, so I think I bring the IR perspective to the world of PR, which, uh, as we all know, is, is I think, valuable. Let me uh, introduce my colleague, Seth Linden, and he can tell you a little bit about himself, and then we'll get started. Thank you, Ed. And Bob, thank you. And thank you to OTC Markets for this opportunity to be able to communicate today. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as mentioned, I am Seth Linden, President and Partner of Dukas Linden Public Relations. And I have worked over many years to execute media relations programs for publicly traded firms as well as privately held firms. And I also bring the background of having worked as a broadcast journalist. So I've sort of seen the other side of the camera, if you will, as well as what journalists are looking for and look forward to communicating that today. Uh, this might be a good segue to really go to our first slide, which shows a quote from the famous Warren Buffett. And this quote, uh, really we love it because it says, it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. And if you think about that, you'll do things differently. It's a famous quote, but we love it because it really signifies two things. Number one, um, it does matter in terms of building relationships with journalists and not just waiting till bad news occurs because even good firms have negative cycles and you don't want to create journalistic relationships during that period. You want to build them before. And secondly, you're building a lot of hard work. You deserve to have coverage. And even when you think you don't, you really do because you're promoting great ideas, you've worked hard to build a public organization, and you deserve to have coverage and we'll talk about that. Uh, and that brings us to our topics uh, today, four main areas. Why engage the media? Because we know that there are uh, plenty of companies that are uh, media shy and, and think that, you know, if I just, uh, if I just uh, keep my head down and stay out of the media, I'll be better off. Uh, we think not, for the reason Seth just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, techniques for attracting the right kind of media attention, I think particularly for small and, and mid-cap companies that might think that they're they, they aren't able to attract the same attention of a, you know, a, a mega cap company. Uh, preparing to meet the media, and then some do's and don'ts. Uh, so let's go right to the next slide. Why engage the media? And uh, believe it or not, this is a question that comes up all the time. So for example, let's say you're in the community banking space or you're in the natural resource space. You might say, you know, we don't have that much to talk about this quarter. But the fact is that you really do. Uh, Ed and I have worked in the community banking space, for example, over the years. And um, an organization, let's say, has 10 branches is really a good um, barometer of change in the community or at the state level in terms of what's happening in the economic cycle, what's happening in terms of mortgage data, what's happening with small businesses. And so uh, a smaller organization can actually be a very good resource for media across the board. And just by sharing your intellectual capital, you're able to expand awareness of the investment story. You're able to reinforce your messages as an organization. You can signal a new growth initiative or even a turnaround. And by being in the media, you're really getting a third-party strong endorsement. And that, that's important because for all the advertising in the world that you may do, it is far better to have the Wall Street Journals of the world or the CNBCs or even a good local community paper or a trade publication saying that you are a credible resource. And it does help for bad news. That's true. I, I just like to piggyback a little bit on what Seth was saying and say that you know if you do not proactively tell your story in the media, someone else will do it for you, and they may do it uh, when the news is bad and, and when it's difficult to defend yourself. 
So we see engaging with the media as, in essence, an insurance policy. If you've built those relationships when the news is good uh, and reporters know you and feel comfortable uh, and you have some credibility with them, then when the news is not so good, uh, you may have your day in court and the ability to tell your side of the story. Um, we believe that while it's tempting to uh, hide when the news is bad, that uh, engaging with the media it helps ensure that your company's perspective gets a fair hearing. Uh, it demonstrates that management isn't hiding because it's, it's just so typical that uh, you know, a company representative was not available to, to comment or did not return phone calls really makes it look like you must have something to hide. Um, it's important to ensure that negative viewpoints don't go unchallenged. Um, you can help build support for management's approach. We've worked with clients that, for example, have activist uh, investors where telling your side, you know, what's the company strategy, why does management and the board think it's the right strategy is a very powerful message and if you don't communicate it, then the only thing that's heard is the other side. Um, and you can, in fact, keep, help keep the story from escalating if you engage the media. Sometimes uh, the bad news is out, your response is out, and, and it can be contained to a one or two day story. So I, I have a question on that, yeah. Bob. So it, it seems that it might be human nature to not be proactive when the news is not great. Uh, how do you deal with your clients in that situation? And also talk about uh, the size of the companies. Does it vary if it's a micro cap company versus a very large cap company? What would your perception be on that? Let me start in the set. Feel free to jump in. And you're absolutely right, Bob. It is human nature to, mm -hmm. to not be proactive and to think, we can only make it worse by engaging them and make it a bigger story. And, and that may be true, and that's why certainly whenever you're considering engaging the media when news is, is difficult, uh, to not only take advice from your communications uh, uh, advisors, but legal and financial and so on. And certainly if, if, if things are in such state of flux that you can't comment uh, in, a, in a definitive way because you may prejudice your, your legal standing um, or you have a disclosure issue, then certainly you, you, you have to be guided by that. That said, um, it's certainly important to tell your side of the story. Uh, if you view bad press as a real estate game, you know, think about a, a story that's, you know, five column inches long, well, it can either be five column inches about what a terrible company you are and all the bad things you've done, or it can be, you know, three and a half column inches about that and one and a half column inches of you defending yourself. Mm. So you take back a little bit of the real estate. Yeah. And that's the value of it. Uh, what I would say is, and we'll get to this a little bit later too, um, preparation is everything. Knowing your messages, staying on message, bridging back to those messages and not letting the reporter take you down a, a, a path you don't want to go down mm -hmm. are very important. Uh, and as to the you know large versus small, um, in a sense, larger companies have more at risk because they are so well known and their mm -hmm. brands are so well known and they probably have less of a choice. As a smaller company, uh, you may attract less attention and therefore engaging with the media may put brackets around the story and keep it from escalating because you're not a name brand and you're, you know, I mean, we think about the current controversies with the airlines and, and the customer service issues, they're in the news every day over that. You can probably put some brackets around that because you're smaller and, and under the radar. I, I think it's also important to make a distinction that it's not just about being quoted in media or appearing in media. It's also about really just talking to media. So even if you decide, you know what, we really don't want to be quoted that much as an organization right now, it's still important to build journalist relationships. And I, I often, and Ed does this too, we refer to the proverbial Rolodex. Um, as I get older, that term becomes increasingly antiquated, unfortunately. But um, it's really important to have a journalistic Rolodex and to make sure you're talking to reporters. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you can sit down with a reporter and have a good background discussion and explain your view as a firm or as an organization. And that allows you to still build a relationship in a pretty safe way and to build up that capital for when you need it down the road. It's a little bit like always being on the, the search for a job. You may be with your organization a long time, but you continue to network and make contacts. It's the same thing with media. Let's uh, look at a case study that uh, illustrates uh, in particular how uh, companies uh, are able to do media when the, when the news is good, but when they've been uh, perhaps 
under-recognized and, and under-reported. Absolutely. Uh, JMP Group is a long-time client, uh, and in the PR world, more than five years is a long-term client. Uh, JMP is about $125 million in market cap, and, and JMP is headquartered in San Francisco. It is publicly traded, but um, it is still a smaller organization, and the firm has been very strategic because they came to us saying, you know, we want more recognition. We've got a great investment banking team. We've got a strong group of analysts who do a lot of coverage. We want to be recognized more, and by having a steady media relations program and the outlets that you see, as well as other publications, JMP has been able to build its brand. And if you think about just the ticker, JMP, it's easy to confuse it with JPM, JP Morgan, and they actually have had some of that confusion, at least they used to in the early years. But by being out regularly and being recognized, that's really helped distinguish the brand, and the firm has continued to grow and has had a lot of successes. Uh, just a note for after uh, we do our presentation today, there is a link worth looking at that shows one of the key principles from the firm on Fox Business. And as you'll note, uh, Mark Lehman is his name. He's really talking about JMP's view of the sector and how um, the organization made some good calls. And it's a very effective piece. And what I think is important about it is that JMP, again, not a major organization, but by doing media regularly, he really owns this segment on Fox Business, and it's great to have for repurposing on the website and, of course, for search engine optimization, looking things up via Google. But uh, if I were to put a headline on this, you don't have to be a large organization to get strategic top-tier media. Right. So let's talk about uh, how you do attract top-tier media, and the next three pages are really uh, talking about attracting media attention, and, and there are really three techniques. The first one we want to talk about is what we call be a thought leader. That is, comment knowledgeably about industry issues. Uh, JMP is a great example of that, talking about the, the, the biotech space, talking about their calls. They weren't talking specifically about their company. They really were talking about their views of the market. Um, to do this successfully, you have to express a differentiated point of view. You have to be interesting. You have to have a, uh, you know, a perspective uh, that, uh, that the media would, would find newsworthy. Often, one way to do that is to cite a survey uh, or cite metrics that support your viewpoint. Uh, we've had clients in the community banking space, for example, that will talk about the mortgage market and the volume that they're doing and the shift between uh, refinance and 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 and, uh, and and new home purchases uh, when news is out and about about the you know the impact of rate increases on the economy. Great way to get out there and tell your story and position yourself um, and you know use the information that you have at your disposal to do it. And I, I would just make the point, Ed and Bob, that. It's also, this is, being a thought leader is also a great way to really get coverage when you normally would have challenges in getting coverage. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you're in the biotech space or the natural resource space. Um, biotech and natural resources may not be um, as top of mind in coverage, particularly for top tier organizations like the Wall Street Journal. They just tend to cover financial services more. But if you're, let's say, in the natural resource space and you're willing to talk about where energy opportunities are, um, what regions are meaningful in terms of exploration, you may not be talking about your company as much as you would if, let's say, you were a financial services company, but by being out and talking about the opportunity set, that really allows you to be a thought leader. So you don't have to talk about your company to be a thought leader, to Ed's point. You can really talk about the sector, the region, and just to give smart views, you're showing your intellectual capital, and I think that's a key point for anyone who might be listening today. You know, I, I, just to build on that, uh, you also, not only do you not have to necessarily just talk about your company, but you don't have to only talk to the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg or Barron's and think that if you, if you haven't done that, you're not successful. Uh, I've worked with a company that's a reseller of aluminum and steel products, about a half a billion dollar revenue company, and uh, in certain quarters, uh, they, their, their results were uh, positively impacted by demand in Latin America for steel, even though Europe was soft. Uh, North America was flat, but they wanted to get out the story that uh, the investment that they'd made in opening up facilities in Mexico and, 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 and Brazil was good for business. And uh, so an interview in American metal markets was a great way to do it because they get to tell their story. Uh, the analysts who follow the industry read AMM 
and it's just a perfect opportunity, probably worth more to them, frankly, than a mention in, in the Wall Street Journal. So in that case, uh, public relations ties right into investor relations because you're, you're hitting your target, uh, a broader target. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're hitting a broader target. You know, obviously, in classic investor relations, you're talking all the time mm -hmm. to the people who know your story and already follow your stock and listen to your conference calls every quarter and, and the analysts who follow you. Um, but you're not necessarily talking to the people who don't know the story, particularly if your market cap is smaller. So using the media gives you that broader uh, distribution system to tell your investor story and to say things that help illuminate why yours is the right strategy, why the company is, is creating value. Let's uh, go on to the, uh, the next uh, slide. Uh, this is a little bit more traditional way of attracting media, and that is breaking news, uh, putting out a release, making an announcement of some innovative uh, initiative. You can certainly schedule uh, media interviews around that, but one of the ways that smaller companies very often attract attention uh, for things that, that might otherwise go unnoticed is to do an exclusive, that is to arrange to, instead, uh, instead of putting out a, a, a press release, and then hoping it gets picked up, uh, to uh, arrange with uh, a, uh, a reporter in advance to break the story, uh, make the announcement of the new product, the new service, uh, moving into a new geographic market, and, uh, and then follow that up with a press release. Now, obviously, you have to be comfortable with the disclosure issues around that, and, and, and that's a discussion collectively to, to, to be had. Absolutely. And, and by the way, on the point of news releases, we are still big fans of issuing news releases. Now, there has been a lot of discussion today uh, with both public and privately held companies. Should we do one? Should we just use social media? Our view is as long as compliance is an, is an agreement, both are very effective tools. And in fact, today when you issue a news release, you don't necessarily issue it because you're hoping to get coverage in traditional media outlets. A news release is very helpful for establishing your online profile because if you have positive news to share and that news release comes up essentially on your page one of Google, what a great way to show positive developments because it doesn't take much as we know to upset your Google profile with negative coverage. The other point I think that, that's important for this slide is to really, I had a colleague used to say media begets media. And what he meant by that is that if you're building relationships with reporters, that leads to additional coverage. So if you have an exclusive, if you have already built a relationship with a reporter or an outlet by, let's say, just giving background on the sector or the space, that reporter is more likely to give you coverage or access to coverage uh, if you have an, an announcement to make. Now, there are no guarantees but you at least get a much better shot. It really goes back to the rules of networking and, again, building that Rolodex. I can't emphasize that enough. The other point that I would make just in terms of a takeaway is being able to have an elevator pitch is so vitally important because there are so many smart executives that Ed and I have worked with through the years, and unfortunately, they have trouble talking about their companies because they know the information so well, and it's difficult to explain sometimes what may be an arc arcane or difficult concept. The elevator pitch really arms you well because it makes you smarter for investor meetings. It allows you to speak to third-party stakeholders. And if you can share a message, message with a journalist, you can do the same clearly with those, those other parties. So having a smart media elevator pitch really allows you, I think, to be a better communicator across the board, and that certainly is applicable to investor relations. Yeah, I'd like to make one more point, actually, before we, we leave this uh, slide, which is uh, Creating your own content, you don't have to just wait for uh, reporters to uh, interview you and create stories. You can do op-eds, uh, of course, social media blog posts and, and, and tweets and so on on relevant topics. Uh, for example, we, uh, we have a client that is in the, uh, in the leadership development and human resources field, and uh, there's been a lot of news lately. I won't name names, but there's a certain company in the uh, ride-hailing business that's been criticized. Uh, uh, and has had a lot of turnover in their COO space, and and uh, they they quickly put together with our help a uh, an op-ed piece, 700 words on when is the right time for a startup company to bring in an outside COO. So, so with, uh, with with social media, what uh, are there any with your clients any specific? social media sites that they use more effectively than others, or is it sort of a jump ball depending on the situation? Sure. Well, 
first of all, because we tend to lean toward financial services, there is more of a conservative nature in terms of dealing with social media. If you're yeah. a consumer brand, you know, you're using Facebook, you're using all the tools. Right. Um, in financial and professional services, there tends to be a heavy reliance on LinkedIn, which we think is a smart strategy, mm -hmm. and then Twitter. Now, the caveat for all of this, I go back to again, is compliance. Does compliance approve of what you're doing from a social media standpoint? That's where it all starts and begins, but or ends, I should say. But but if, assuming that compliance is uh, allowing you to use social media tools such as LinkedIn, we think it's very important for search to have a very strong LinkedIn profile, both as individual executives and as an organization. I know that, that OTC obviously believes in this. Um, being able to use LinkedIn to post updates or to share content, that's a wonderful tool to give status updates. And Twitter can be a wonderful tool. It doesn't have to be that you're using Twitter to essentially just say, hey, I'm frustrated by my flight today or I didn't like the restaurant. You can use Twitter in a smart strategic way by sharing news and views that are thought out in advance. You can actually have a schedule of tweets written out in advance and you can have your team work to put those tweets out in a very methodical way. And you can also repurpose the media via Twitter too that, that you might be getting in let's say the trade publications or the high tier publications. So let's um, move ahead. Uh, we actually covered the material on the next slide, so let's go ahead one more. Um, you know, Seth talked about your elevator pitch. So uh, this is a, uh, a giveaway, a, a free bonus for participating in this webinar. Uh, it's just a, a message creation cheat sheet that we've used uh, to help clients create messages that are clear and concise and well supported. So if, if you think about what are the issues or the, or the parts of my corporate strategy that I, that I want people to understand better, what are the messages that would help uh, illuminate those, context about the marketplace, about your competition, and then if asked in an interview, what are the proof points that I would pull out? whether it's uh, metrics or uh, survey data or, uh, you know, last quarter our, you know, our revenue or not, you know, non-interest interest income was up 15% and that's symptomatic of, you know, how our strategy is working. Uh, that's for you to decide, but feel free to use this kind of tool to help decide what those messages ought to be and, and how to support them. Let's uh, go on to the next uh, slide. And uh, as we come to the close to the end of the prepared remarks, we want to talk about if you've decided that you want to meet the media in good times or bad, how best to do it? What are the best practices? And Bob, maybe I'll throw a question to you at least to think about. Okay. So if, if, if let's say I were a reporter and I were doing an interview with you and I said, Bob, how upset is OTC about the regulatory environment today? Now, first of all, I may be making a very broad assumption that OTC is upset to begin with. Right. And secondly, you may not want to answer that question. I probably would advise you not to answer that right. question. But the, the tendency tends to be that somebody would say, well, we're not concerned about the regulatory environment at all. Now, that might seem to be a pretty innocuous comment, but imagine that quote out of context in a news article. It might look very defensive. So this is where preparation and getting ready to meet the media is so important because the other way to answer that question in a much more effective way is, well, first of all, I'm not sure that I would agree with the premise of your question. Secondly, we think that having a strong regulatory framework is very important today. Right. Notice that I acknowledge the question, but I didn't restate the reporter's comments. That's a nuance, but it's very key to successfully managing an interview. And I think when you look at these tips, what it really comes down to is really about having control in the interview. So getting ready for an interview means anticipating what negative questions a reporter might ask, having your messages in a crisp and clear way, and answering questions the way that you want to as a measure of control. Right, and you have to be aware of that because the reporter is asking the question to try to make news, to try to get you to react in a way that, that they might get more news out of so you have to be prepared to answer in your way right precisely yeah. yeah and you don't want to get you don't want to get off track that's why the first point on, on this particular page is start with your conclusion make your point what's your message um, we're here to tell you that our, our our growth strategy is is working and we are uh, well on our way to becoming the high performing regional bank that we had, that we you know always wanted to be to create value for our shareholders um, but be crisp and concise to points we've made earlier. Uh, Seth talked about really bridging to the message you want, not the message, not the necessarily simply answering the question you've been asked. 
Um, we're going to give you permission here that it's okay to say, um, I don't have the answer to that question. We'll get back to you. Now that's tougher in a in a on camera interview than it is in in a mm -hmm. in a in a print interview. But there are ways to say uh, or you know I. I that's really a speculative question. I really can't answer that now. That's okay. It is okay not to answer a question if you do it in a deft way. Um, very, very important uh, is really the two final points on this page. One is there's an issue of whether an interview is on or off the record. Lots of uh, executives are afraid to talk to the media because they're afraid that what they say will be on the record. Uh, it is possible to go off the record to provide a reporter with information that is for background, for context, but you have to have that clearly set forth at the beginning of the interview. What are the ground rules? We're going to conduct this off the record. Is that okay? And get, get an affirmative uh, nod from the reporter and a verbal, yes, this will be off the record um, if, if your public relations or communications uh, advisors are teeing up the interview by email even better is to have a written response from the reporter that says, yes, I understand that this will be off the record. Um, and then the other thing is, and this is not just the Public Relations Full Employment Act, always, always, always have a PR representative in the interview with you uh, to take notes, to be a gut check on things, to um, make a record of, of things that might you know, require a follow-up response, uh, but certainly to be someone who can uh, uh, who can keep you back on track if the interview wanders off track. And I, I can't emphasize, I, nor can add, the, the power of practicing. If you take 30 minutes before an interview to really just run through the questions, make sure that you feel comfortable with what you're going to say, it's a lot more effective to have an interview conducted that way because you're, you're, you've really gone through a dress rehearsal. And I always tell people in sort of a coy fashion, don't think of your answers during the interview. You really want to know what you're going to be saying already. That doesn't mean don't be thoughtful and don't respond to the reporter's questions, but you really want to have a game plan. What am I trying to accomplish with this interview? And as part of that, you also have to make sure that you understand what the reporter's needs are, because reporters are not out to give you free advertising. They have a job to do, and you have to know what their coverage is like and what sort of angle they're going to be looking for. And that's why we always tell people when they start in the PR business, the best thing you can do is to read a reporter's work. Know how they cover a story. They may cover your beat, but if the, if the angle is con con consistently negative, think about whether or not you want to deal with that reporter. So that, that's, that's all part of doing your homework, but it's, it's vitally important. Let's, uh, to wrap up, let's look at some do's and don'ts. Um, and uh, on the next page. And uh, so Seth's point is, uh, is, is again, the second point there, reviewing the reporter's prior coverage uh, so that you know what their interests are, but you also know what their biases are. Uh, practice your core messages uh, so that, as, as Seth said, you don't have to think about them. Um, anticipate and prepare for tough questions. Rehearse. Um, and then, you know, use energy for emphasis. Be up for the interview. Try to forget about, um, you know, the, 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 your, 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 your kid cracked up the car um, and, and, you know, or other things that might befall you and just think about, I'm, I'm here, I'm here to make the sale. Um, I think that speaking to the media is very much like speaking to your sell side analysts or your buy side. You're, you're there to you know, to help them understand what the values are. Uh, and then finally, on the don't side, if we want to go to the, to the next page, um, don't confuse an interview with a legal deposition. You're not there to give yes or no answers. You're there to convey a point of view and sell something. Don't forget your core messages. And uh, an important thing, and something that I, I uh, sometimes fall afoul of, is don't keep speaking once you've made your point. When you've, you've told the reporter what your message is, he or she's made a note of it, uh, don't keep talking because the danger is you're going to get into trouble. You're going to say you're going to say something that you that you shouldn't. Uh, don't let incorrect assumptions go unchallenged, uh, but don't necessarily repeat the negative question. Uh, don't answer hypothetical or speculative questions if you don't think it's appropriate. Um, don't be evasive or defensive. We've seen a lot of hostile CEOs interviewed. Obviously, you know generally over bad times. Um, and again, really, and let's end up with the 
don't assume something is off the record on, unless you've set the ground rules in advance and you know that it's off the record. I, I once had a former uh, congressman as a client, and he said he conducted interviews with the idea that anything he said he didn't want to see in the Washington Post the next day. And I think that's very good advice. And what it also means is even when you have an off-the-record discussion, remember that it is a professional discussion, it's a collegial discussion, but don't say anything that would uh, you wouldn't want to see the next day regardless. Uh, I once had a client many years ago who used an expletive at the end of the interview. It was really as he was hanging up, but sure enough, that ended up in the story. So always be conscious that it's like a business meeting, friendly, professional, but Keep it in that in that vein. And with that, uh, maybe we'll wrap up our remarks again we've, with no expletives. With no expletives, no. right? I think we managed to avoid that. Uh, but we are delighted to have had this opportunity to chat with you, and we'd be happy to uh, respond to some questions. Well, thank you, uh, Ed and Seth, for a very informative uh, session. We have a couple of questions. Um, so one question that that's here is. Uh, how, how do you handle uh, getting blindsided by a reporter? And related to that. Um, is it always good practice and receptive from the reporter's perspective to go over the ground rules before you do an interview, if it's live in particular? Uh, the answer to the latter part of your question is yes. Okay. Always go over ground rules. And we actually, surprisingly perhaps, are fans of broadcast television because in a print interview, the reporter is taking an excerpt of what you're saying, generally speaking. In a broadcast interview, particularly if it's a live setting, let's say on the CNBCs or the Bloombergs of the world, mm -hmm. you really have about five minutes in general to tell your story. And five minutes can be a lot of time. And what, what broadcast or, or radio does this too accounts for is it allows the tone to come out. And tone really matters because if, if I say in an interview, uh, we're pleased with our progress, that sounds so, so, but if I say on television, you know, we're really pleased with our progress and we think that we're moving in the right direction, that's an important nuance. Mm -hmm. But broadcast is important, but yes, establish the ground rules with the producers before. This is what we're willing to talk about. We don't want to talk about this. Um, also, I think it is important to be responsive, regardless of whether or not you're going to participate in an interview. Always get back to the reporter. So someone on the communications team can simply say, you know, we'd love to speak at another time, but uh, we won't be able to participate in this interview or we need to decline to comment. But don't just ignore the reporter. And then in terms of trying to avoid being blindsided, yeah. uh, it really comes down to, again, knowing what your message is. What are you there to say? Uh, be practicing uh, really, I, I mean, I've actually had cases where clients have, have, have gotten angry with me because I was asking what they perceived to be obnoxious questions, but, I, but I, was, I was doing it to sensitize them to the fact that the reporter was probably going to be just as bad, if not worse. And if you practice those and you, you know where the pitfalls are and you know the questions that are not appropriate to answer, uh, then you're ready for that and you can say, uh, you know, it's not appropriate to answer that question. This is a matter that's under litigation. I can't really talk about it. What I can say is, uh, so you, you know, each, each situation will be different, but I, I think you have to take a breath, think for two seconds about what your answer is, and, and then come back to your key message. Thank you. Uh, so we have one, one more question. And uh, for, for, a, for a company that's really starting out, uh, in, in getting their message out, does it help to start with industry type publications, sector type publications versus taking a broad scoped approach and again putting the size of the company into perspective? Yes and no is okay. the answer. And uh, what I mean by that is every media outlet has a different function and form that may be useful to your goals. And one thing we really didn't talk about is public relations and media relations really starts with sitting down internally and saying, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Now, that might sound so basic, but if you think about what you're trying to achieve as an organization, let's say you just went public, mm -hmm. are you trying to just draw more attention from an investor perspective? Are you trying to gain more credibility on the street? Those goals can be very much aligned or they can be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. it, it really depends. But you have to sit down and say, what is it that we're trying to accomplish as a firm? And then what are our messages that reflect that? Um, so once you've determined what those messages are, you may go to the different outlets for different reasons. So for example, if you're in the natural resources space, mm -hmm. you might go to a trade publication because you'll be able to generate 
an in-depth profile on a new discovery, let's say in an oil or natural gas basin, that the Wall Street Journal or the FT may not cover. But you may go to the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal to talk about your views in terms of the industry and your thoughts on uh, oil production. And both can serve an important purpose. Uh, we tend to like a mix because profiles in trade publications, as Ed referenced earlier, can be very influential in terms of building your organization. But there's no doubt that being quoted or featured in top tier media can give you a certain cachet and allow you to punch above your weight class. There's no doubt that if you're being quoted in the Wall Street Journal on a regular basis, that gives you a certain halo effect that you might otherwise not have. Right. Uh, but of course, you know, not every story is going to be Wall Street Journal, New York Times ready uh, the first day. And so the other advantage of dealing with trade publications or community publications is uh, it's practice for you. If you've never engaged with the media before, start small, get comfortable, and, uh, and then work your way up. Very good. So I, I believe that's uh, all the questions that we have at this time. So again, we, we at OTC Markets would very much like to thank you, Seth and Ed, for, uh, for participating in this very informative uh, webinar. And uh, we, for, for those listening, we will be sending a, a recording of this session to everyone that, that has uh, listened in on it. So we thank uh, the attendees as well for joining us. And and thanks very much. We'll sign off at this time. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.